This presentation will demonstrate the magnitude of the project and illustrate some of the more interesting and important field engineering and construction methods used in making this an outstanding bridge construction job. We have passed through the fringe of Oakland's commercial district, traveling west on 6th Street, and have just driven onto a previously completed portion of the Cypress Street Viaduct near Market Street. This portion was the first of the three contracts required for the entire structure and was completed in October 1955 by Fredrickson and Watson contractors under W.C. Names, resident engineer, at a cost of $1,700,000. The ramps included in this portion were put to use to expedite the flow of East Shore traffic by channeling it away from the heavy local cross traffic between port, industrial, and commercial areas of the community. The bridge department has been successful in planning a project to provide for the movement of 50,000 vehicles per day through a congested area without undue delay and yet make it possible to efficiently construct the relieving facility within the confined space immediately adjacent to the existing traffic lanes. Basic planning and geometric design of the project was done by the District 4 organization of the Division of Highways. Logical solution of the problem dictated the use of a continuous viaduct type of freeway at this location. Princip principal structural design of the facility, other than street work, became an un undertaking of the bridge department of the Division of Highways. The predominance of bridge work in this project again designated the bridge department as the administering authority for the contracts. The District 4 Construction Department assisted with field engineering and inspection of road and related works. The Cypress Street Viaduct is essentially a two-mile-long double-deck structure connecting the Bay Bridge distribution structure on the north with the east-west section of the East Shore Freeway through Commercial Oakland between 5th and 6th Streets. The viaduct route coincides with the old center line of Cypress Street. The completed project provides four lanes northbound on the lower deck, four lanes southbound on the upper deck, with local traffic at street level using one-way roadways on each side of the viaduct. Areas under the structure, other than cross streets, will be fenced off from use for the present. The resident engineer was assisted on the two contracts by G.A. Verdugo and Noble Jones as deputy resident engineers and W.G. Baum as office engineer. Contractors Grove, Shepard, Wilson, and Krug of California Incorporated from Seattle and New York achieved spectacular construction progress under the direction of K.P. Morris as project manager. We have completed our two-mile drive-through of the job and are now arriving at the distribution structure. We shall take to the air and review the site and progress of the job as of late May 1956. We are in a light plane on a bumpy day over the distribution structure and headed south along the east side of the job. Traffic is still using a portion of Old Cypress Street with frontage roads under construction. All stages of construction are visible as we proceed over the job. In the vicinity of 20th Street, a deck pour is underway on the lower deck. Construction of the upper deck is just getting started near 15th Street. Lower deck construction on the second contract is joining the first contract at this location. This work was started near 10th Street. All engineering line and grade control, as well as structure inspection, was done by bridge department personnel. Co-producers of this film, Bill Swinney and Gil Verdugo, here exhibiting Alfred Hitchcock tendencies, shot the successive sequences as a record of progress on this unusual project. Our portion of the 379 footings required for the viaduct evoked much thought towards efficient staking procedures. Engineering originality devised this collapsible template, which a two-man party can use for staking excavation limits and piling lines for dozens of footings per day. 
The template is assembled, spotted by placing the long pointers at reference points which were previously carefully set, checked, and double-checked. The corners of excavation limits and outside pile lines were marked by using orange paint from spray cans. Two jobs have thus been accomplished in one operation, marking the footing for excavation and furnishing all necessary information for locating piling. Dick Douglas and Bill Swinney pick up the template and move ahead the approximate 80 feet to locate the next footing where the process is repeated. The contractor was right behind us with a king-size pneumatic paving breaker. Prior to excavating for footings in Old Cypress Street, it was necessary to break up from 8 to 24 inches of concrete and or asphalt paving in order that excavating equipment could be used effectively. Footing excavation was done by using a backhoe. This tool can work in the tight corners and get practically all of the material without hand labor. Excavated material was hauled to stockpiles for later use if it was suitable. Lack of space prevented storage at the site. Efficient use of engineering talent required that the bridge department pile driving inspector stake the piling during his idle time between closely observing pile driving, inspecting concreting of piles, and keeping records. All of this was a two-man job usually done by one man. He accomplished the staking by stretching strings across the excavation to the previously marked outside lines of piles. Intersections were plumbed by using a range pole and fisheye bubble, which located the corner piles in the bottom. With the corner piles located and the particular pattern at hand, the remaining piles were staked. Of the more than 5,800 piles used in the foundation work, approximately 4,000 were driven on the 10th to distribution structure contract. Most of these, some 25 miles of piling, consisted of 12-inch diameter, 7-gauge, spiral-welded pipe shells capped on the bottom with a three-quarter inch thick steel plate. Piles were driven to a bearing value of at least 45 tons, conforming to the engineering news formula. Handling and driving equipment consisted of an antiquated but adequate steam crawler crane equipped with 60-foot leads and a single acting steam hammer delivering 15,000 foot-pounds of energy per blow. This, the department's first extensive experience with spiral welded pipe shells, proved very satisfactory. Collapses and other failures were rare. Water in the shells was practically non-existent. After cutting off to proper grade, the shells were filled with concrete chuted directly from the transit mixer trucks. The heavy gauge shell is the only reinforcement needed other than dowels into the footing. Footing construction followed right behind pile driving. After trimming the subgrade, prefabricated forms were set, reinforcing steel placed, grade strips and column base templates installed, and concrete placed by shooting directly into the forms from transit mixers. Notice the use of a baffle plate at the end of the chute to create a vertical drop and prevent segregation in the concrete. Consolidation was achieved with high frequency internal electric vibrators. The footings were neatly floated off and column dowels installed. 